that we're a strong believer in is that you have to have standardization of everything you do, including standardized extubation support. You can't having you can't have people randomly extubating babies because a different faculty comes on, a different staff neonatologist is on. And part of standardized extubation support is to think about the concept of ad trauma. We're very good as neonatologists understanding value trauma, bearer trauma, but I think we're not that good about avoiding ad trauma. So we want to avoid these babies falling apart when they're extubated. So we want to extubate them only when ready. Um, a 22-weeker cannot be treated like a 29-weeker. A 29-weeker might be ready at day one of life after surfactant. Um, a 22-weeker is not going to be ready, even though you might think, oh, look, there are minimal vent settings, quote, unquote. Um, they'll probably be more ready when they're actually seven weeks old. So their postmenstrual age is 29 weeks and one seven because you want them to have a sustainable respiratory drive. You don't want to be fighting huge amounts of central apnea. And that's going to, the central apnea is going to lead to atelectra trauma and hypoxia leading to pulmonary hypertension. So we don't push them off. Um, again, this is not a 30 week, a 28 weeker, or 30 weeker, 31 weeker. These are 22, 23 weekers. Um, Let's look at some, some data. And here's a paper from 2017. And you read deep into the paper and you find this, a fascinating fact that failed extubation in the first weeks of life and in this population, now the population they study were actually older. This was 24 and zero sevens to 27 and six sevens. So failing in a population that's not, not even as young as 22 weeks and 23 weekers is significantly associated with increased death before discharge. 28% mortality versus 6% mortality. This is almost five-fold difference. We control 100% whether someone is electively extubated. So if we just avoid pushing these babies off in the first weeks of life, we've just reduced their chance of death by 500%. Um, there's not many things that we can do that can reduce death by 500%. So it's very uh, critical not to push them off. And of course, in this study, it was easy to predict who was gonna fail. The ones who failed were the 24-week babies. And the ones who failed were the 500-gram babies, not the 900-gram 27-weekers. Uh, and so it was very easy to know who was gonna fail. Um, and so knowing that you, that you can predict that, you should not be doing it. So the goal was to minimize multiple failure attempts. Now, it wasn't just mortality that went up in this paper. IVH rate went up, infection rates went up, actually severe BPD actually went up because when you're failing, you're usually developing that electrotrauma. And when you have to use much higher pressure that, that you were on than before, once those lungs are collapsed down, there's something known as the hysteresis curve. And it takes a lot more pressure to reinflate because you're going on the inspiratory limb of the curve than to maintain it. So once you fall off that hysteresis curve, you end up using a lot more pressure than you used before and starting to damage the alveolar epithelium as you reinflate and get capillary leak and inactivate your surfactant. So the goal is to minimize multiple failure attempts. So we do not push these kids off. Again, I'm talking 22 and 23, not not an IUGR 26 weeker, not a vigorous 27 weeker, not even a vigorous 24 week. I'm talking 22 and 23 weekers. Now, when we extubate, um, we always go to non invasive ventilation. We tend to use uh, NAVA currently for non invasive ventilation. Um, but I think the key is any non invasive ventilation is quite good. Usually, most of these babies are over between 800 and 1,000 grams, some might be a little bit bigger. And we follow this here, you know, let's go again, look at some more literature on this. So here's a, again, a great study by uh, Dr. Ramanathion and a randomized controlled trial of nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation versus nasal CPAP. And showing that if you extubate to nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation, you cut the rate of extubation failure in half, lower the rate of clinical BPD, lower the rate of physiologic BPD. So, once again, it showed if you 
decrease extubation failure, you have much better outcome. What's a good way to decrease extubation failure? Go to non-invasive ventilation first, and then eventually transition to nasal CPAP once ventilation doesn't become an issue and once central apnea doesn't become an issue.